This is Matthew Cratter's Bitcoin University. Today I want to talk about sending US dollars using Bitcoin. We're going to be talking about the Lightning Network, Tether and USDT, the stablecoin, as well as Taproot Assets, formerly known as Taro. But first I want to bring everyone up to speed. We're getting a lot of new viewers to this channel. So I want to walk through the various steps, how we get to Taro Assets, because it's not easy. Beginning with the Bitcoin network, of course, peer-to-peer -peer network comprised of nodes that relay blocks and transactions to each other over the internet. That's the network. Then we have the blockchain itself, one block after another, all chained together going back to January 2009 to the present, also containing Bitcoin's entire transaction history, as well as current UTXO set, which is how much unspent Bitcoin is sitting at each Bitcoin address. Synonyms that are often used for this base layer are on-chain layer one base layer this is the bitcoin network in the bitcoin blockchain so that's basically layer one lightning network is built on top of layer one and it's a network of payment channels that can be used to send sats globally sats are just satoshis or 100 million satoshis in a single bitcoin in order to get sats onto the lightning network someone needs to lock up an equal amount on the base layer that can be you if you open up a lightning channel with someone else or you can just use a lightning wallet and never have to worry about these things but in order to get those sats satoshis onto the lightning network someone needs to lock them up on the base layer on layer one using a two of two multi-sig is how it works on each side this ensures that we don't end up with more than 21 million bitcoin since sats used on the lightning network are locked up there on the base layer as we said and cannot move until that lightning payment channel is closed by doing another on-chain transaction. Now the Bitcoin network, 10 minute blocks on average can be quote unquote slow and expensive. This is of course relative because there's no other way to send a bearer asset like this as securely and quickly. The closest thing we have in the world today is moving physical gold by plane or boat, which is of course a complete joke. So we can't compare the Bitcoin network to something like Visa, which is a uh, layer four or layer five. It's not really the base, the base layer when it comes to fiat. So we have the Bitcoin network, which is relatively slow, but gives you really, really good security advantages and settlement finality. Then the Lightning Network, which is the layer two built on top of it, is much faster, very fast transactions, and usually much lower transaction fees as well. Bitcoin Network is mainly a settlement network for larger or more important transactions. This is how it's going to end up, though today, Bitcoin transactions have been fairly cheap, and so people can use the base layer quite cheaply today. This will probably change over time, and people will be forced to migrate to higher and higher layers. So then the Bitcoin network will just be mainly the settlement network, and then the Lightning network will be a faster, cheaper network on top for fast, cheap, smaller transactions. For example, the classic example, buying a cup of coffee so that the merchant doesn't have to wait 10 minutes for a block to be found analogy using quick payments with your credit card that would be lightning and then settling your monthly debt with a credit card company using your bank account this would be the bitcoin layer one on-chain settlement it's not an exact analogy but it can give you an idea of what's going on and it's important to realize as well that money always scales in layers this is how the gold standard scaled this is how the fiat standard scaled and it's how the bitcoin standard is going to scale as well because if you try to do everything on the base layer, you're going to end up with an extremely bloated and unwieldy blockchain like Solana or Ethereum has these days, which hurts decentralization and neutrality because not everyone has the money or technical know-how when these blockchains get very big and technically complica complicated. Not everyone has the money to buy the storage or the RAM or have the technical know-how to run a node and participate in this consensus. That's why it's important to have a minimal on-chain footprint when you're using these blockchains and also to have a blockchain that really is focused on conserving space like the Bitcoin blockchain is. It has these block size limits. So let's say that we want to come up with a way to send US dollars using Bitcoin now that we're aware of the Bitcoin network and we're aware of the Lightning network. It makes sense to target the Lightning network for this because it's faster and cheaper than layer one, than the base layer. One way to send US dollars using Bitcoin, this is more of a side note, is using a company like Strike. If you want to send money to your, back to your relatives in Mexico, for example, and avoid having to use Western Union with the long lines and high fees, and who knows what happens on the Mexican side where you might get extorted as you're going into the, the Western Union, you can instead use the Strike app, download it on your phone. You load up some US dollars to your Strike wallet, which then gets converted to SATs, 
which then gets sent over the Lightning Network to Mexico. And then those sats are converted to Mexican pesos or US dollars by strike when they hit your parents' wallet in Mexico. This is a simplified version, at least this, this is my understanding of how, how strike initially worked. It may be more complicated now, but that's one way using a custodial company like strike to, you, to send US dollars using the Bitcoin Lightning Network. If you want to send US dollars using non-banking rails, in other words, not using Wells Fargo or Bank of America or some of these large American US banks, you could also use a stable coin like USDT. USDT is backed mostly by US treasuries or T-bills, very short-term US government debt, and one USDT is equal to one dollar. There's an arbitrage that goes on here that keeps these two in line. USDT is mainly intended for those outside the U.S. who want U.S. dollars, but cannot access U.S. dollars through the traditional banking system. So U.S. dollars are not great. They're a sinking ship like all fiat money. They're losing purchasing power over time, but they're still much better, obviously, than most local currencies like the Argentine peso or the Turkish lira or Brazilian real or really most currencies in the world, which are often hyperinflating and destroying people's savings. If you're finding this video helpful so far, I just ask you to help to support this channel's educational mission. Hit the subscribe button. That really does help to re the reach of this channel. Leave a like, leave a comment, question, suggestion for a future video. Share this video with a friend or family member or maybe co-worker at the office. So USDT is the, uh, is the asset, it's a, uh, the crypto, and it's backed by real US dollars, usually in the form of T-bills or US government debt, which is very close to cash. This asset, USDT, can be sent using a variety of different rails or networks. That's very important to recognize. And if we go to the Tether website, we can see here that it's on lots of different, it's on Polkadot, it's on Tezos, et cetera. But the three main places where USDT is sent, the main crypto rails are Ethereum, currently about $75 billion worth of Tether on there, on Tron, about $61 billion worth, and on Solana, less than $2 billion dollars worth. So these are the main crypto rails that people are currently using to send USDT, which can be minted on any of these different networks or blockchains. Now Tron, it's a centralized joke of a network, but it is cheap and gets the job done for those in the global south who aren't worried about decentralization per se. So a lot of people use USDT on Tron, for example, in Argentina to send US dollars or these US dollar stable coins to each other. Ethereum is similar, but usually has much higher fees than Tron. This is another reason, this is a parenthetical here, but it's important to realize this is another reason that ETH has been dying the past few years. It's been losing market share on both ends to Bitcoin and to other cryptocurrencies. So it's really in a very bad spot. It's been losing market share to Solana and Tron, as we've seen on Tether, on USDT. And also ETH is not ultrasound money like Bitcoin is. It's not fast and cheap like Solana and Tron. So ETH really is the worst of both worlds. And if you're still holding some, you really should get out of it before it continues to depreciate even more against Bitcoin. Now, does the degree of centralization of the network really matter, of these crypto rails really matter, when the asset that you're sending, USDT, can easily be censored or frozen by the issuer? Because this is a centralized issuer, which is Tether, of course. That's hard to say, but one thing I would say that is as Bitcoiners, we should at least ask if there's a way to bring some of this stablecoin transaction activity away from these ship coins, away from altcoins, and bring it back to Bitcoin. And when people say this back to Bitcoin, they mean this because USDT was initially launched using the Bitcoin network and the Omni protocol going back in to uh, 2014. So stablecoins really started on Bitcoin. There wasn't that much interest in stablecoins back then. And when Ethereum launched, much of this USDT activity, as I understand it, moved over to Ethereum and then from Ethereum moved over to Tron. Finally, something changed in November 2021 that made it possible to actually bring USDT to bring Tether back to Bitcoin. And this was the Taproot upgrade, which was a new backwards compatible software version. It was a soft fork that can be run by nodes on the Bitcoin network. So that's where this word Taproot comes from. It comes from the Bitcoin Taproot upgrade, which was an upgrade to the consensus, but it was backwards compatible. Taproot made it possible to develop a new protocol called Taproot Assets. This used to be called Taro, and I believe there was some lawsuit and someone else was using the name, if I remember correctly, but it's now called Taproot Assets. Taproot Powered Protocol, so powered by this new Taproot upgrade in Bitcoin. A Taproot Powered Protocol for issuing assets on Bitcoin that could be transferred over the Lightning Network 
for instant high volume, low fee transactions. At its core, Taproot Assets taps into the security and stability of the Bitcoin network and the speed, scalability, and low fees of Lightning. So this is really a match made in heaven. It's important to note here as well that you can issue any assets using Taproot Assets. It doesn't just have to be stable coins. Those stable coins are the obvious use case, and that's why we are covering that today. And so now that Taproot Assets is out, Tether is able to bring USDT to on-chain to layer one and also to layer two to the Lightning Network. This was an announcement from the Bitcoin conference in San Salvador and El Salvador, January 30th, 2025. Tether announced the integration of USDT into Bitcoin's ecosystem, including both its base layer and the Lightning Network. Supported by the new Taproot Powered Protocol, Taproot Assets, and developed by Lightning Labs, this integration combines Bitcoin's unmatched decentralization security with the speed and scalability of the Lightning Network. So USDT is returning to its Bitcoin roots and will soon be available on Bitcoin rails, both on-chain and on the Lightning Network. Is this a good or bad thing? That's the question many of you have been asking. I think the answer is yes, it is a good thing and it's a bad thing as well. It's quite complicated and you can see me sort of think through it in this video. So I think it's a great idea to try to defund Tron and Ethereum by stealing stablecoin market share from them. That's really mostly all that they have left in terms of activity on their networks. Question, will people in the global south migrate away from Tron and Ethereum to Bitcoin for their USDT payments? That's hard to say right now. Time will tell. But networks are sticky. One argument that they will is that they already migrated from Bitcoin to Ethereum to Tron, and so maybe the migration back to Bitcoin won't be a big deal. But time will tell whether this happens. And mobile wallets like the Aqua Wallet are trying to build bridges that will suck this USDT liquidity out of the other crypto networks and on to Bitcoin. So that's a good thing in itself. Here's where I keep getting stuck, though, as I've mentioned in previous videos. More people using USDT clearly extends US dollar global dominance as people desert their weak local currencies and begin to use US dollars instead in the form of stable coins like USDT. Personally, I'd prefer to onboard the whole world to Bitcoin, not to Federal Reserve IRS payment tokens. US dollar is not a pretty thing. Some people argue that once you have a USDT mobile wallet that you're using for daily spending and saving, maybe in Argentina or Brazil or one of these places, it's a great stepping stone to becoming a Bitcoiner, especially if the wallet you're using makes it easy to convert your USDT to BTC to Bitcoin at any time. While I think it's true, I think that most people become Bitcoiners because they have no choice and they see their savings getting eaten up by inflation. They need to do something. That's what brought Michael Saylor into Bitcoin in 2020. That's what brought a lot of people in Turkey and Lebanon and similar places into Bitcoin as their local currencies hyperinflated. It's what brought me into Bitcoin as well. I think it would be best if people just bit the bullet and went straight straight to Bitcoin rather than going through this intermediate USDT state. We all know that the US dollar is going to hyperinflate and die one of these days, probably not this year or next year, but definitely sometime in the next 5, 10, 25, or 50 years. These things are very hard to time. So I would like to see a lot more people owning Bitcoin rather than onboarding them to US dollars instead. Now here's the thing, of course, it's slightly awkward for me to be criticizing people in the global south for wanting to use US dollars and USDT, especially since I still have multiple US bank accounts that allow me to easily use USD. So it's important not to be sort of first world hypocrites about this. But here's the other thing, I'm trying to cut my ties to the US dollar every single day a little bit more. If you're holding US dollars, you're helping to fund the central bankers, the fiat system, the US federal government. These are not groups that I personally want to fund. So I'm trying to cut my ties to the US dollar every single day a little bit more. I'm trying to move more and more of my life onto a Bitcoin standard, both earning Bitcoin and spending Bitcoin, thereby bypassing holding any US dollars, which parenthetically also makes the US dollar price of Bitcoin increasingly irrelevant, which is nice as you move on to a Bitcoin standard. Here's the stumbling block. If we could get Trump to abolish the U.S. capital gains tax on spending Bitcoin, then it would be much easier to do this because currently in the U.S., if you spend your Bitcoin on goods and services, technically you owe a capital gains tax on that if the price is higher than where you bought the Bitcoin. But if we could get Trump to abolish this tax, then I would move completely to living on Bitcoin. Pro stablecoin people argue that downloading a mobile wallet for USDT is a stepping stone, as we said, to eventually wanting to own some Bitcoin in that same mobile wallet. They may be right, but I'm not totally sure. And from a geopolitical perspective, the US definitely wants people using US dollars or USDT rather than some BRICS issued currency. I'm not personally worried about BRICS 
issued currencies. These will not be very competitive because gold or commodity backed money is not going to be able to compete with Bitcoin in terms of appreciation. And so that's not a real concern, but obviously the US dollar wants people to use its currency and not some other coalition's currency. The US government also really likes that Tether's business model requires it to buy larger and larger amounts of US treasuries as it grows to back its USDT, thereby funding the US government. This is something I talked about in this video, which I'll link to in the description notes below. The secret plan to save the US dollar and to export US toxic debt by basically getting more and more people to hold US dollar stable coins like Tether. I'd personally like to defund the US government rather than help to fund it by having Tether buy its debt. The more USDT someone buys, the better it is for the US government since it means that Tether needs to buy more US debt. Now the counter response to this is that Tether has been using its billions of dollars of annual profits to invest in lots of Bitcoin startups and open source projects in the Bitcoin ecosystem. So it's definitely a good actor within the Bitcoin ecosystem, as well as helping to pump, pump Bitcoin for all of us by buying lots of it for Tether's own corporate balance sheet. So these are real Bitcoiners who believe in Bitcoin and Tether is currently holding about $8 billion worth of Bitcoin, more than 83,000 Bitcoin. So those are some of my still inchoate thoughts on this topic. Let me know what you think. Let me know in the comment section below. Also hit that subscribe button if you haven't done already. Leave a like, comment, question, suggestion for a future video, and share this video with a friend or family member. Thanks a lot for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.